Welcome everyone to AFSA's Inside Diplomacy. Uh, we have a full and very exciting and I think very timely program for you today. And we'll get started in just one minute as everyone is still um, coming online. And I just wanted to, um, while we are still having everyone settle in, I wanted to go over a few of our housekeeping items, if you will, for today. As usual, our program today is going to last one hour and we have it separated into about a 35 minute discussion um, about the topic and then we'll open it to audience Q&A. And so at any point through, throughout the discussion, we encourage you to type your questions into the chat box um, and the earlier, the better. And then we'll amass those questions and um, we'll have uh, Ambassador Rubin read those questions out loud when the time comes. Um, the event is being recorded, as you may have noticed. We will be posting this event on our, the recording of the event on our website, and we will also send it out to everyone who registered, um, along with some additional uh, information. If you know of someone who was interested and couldn't come, I encourage everyone to share the recording um, with anyone who might be interested. Then finally, as you may have noticed, we have turned off uh, the video and microphones. Um, and um, the, they'll stay off for the duration of the event. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome AFSA's president, Ambassador Eric Rubin, to formally kick off our event. Thank you very much, Nadia, and welcome everybody. And thanks for joining us for what I hope will be a very interesting discussion and a very uh, I would say new topic, not that Arctic diplomacy is new, but the fact that so much is happening and the fact that we now have a new American consulate in Greenland in the Arctic is very exciting as well. And so I want to say thank you for joining us. This is part of our series, looking at some of the bigger foreign policy issues and how they relate to all of us in the foreign service. And uh, we have uh, a great topic and a great speaker today. And um, I also wanted to flag for everybody that the current May issue of our Foreign Service Journal is devoted to Arctic diplomacy. If you haven't seen it, um, you can read the current issue online at afsa.org. And uh, for those of you who subscribe, you should have received it by now, I hope so. Um, obviously, this is a timely subject for many reasons. One is that uh, climate change means that uh, ice is melting. There are new transportation routes that are opening up uh, across uh, Europe, Asia, and North America. And there are new possibilities for exploiting natural resources, but there are also new dangers to the environment. And there are also new military and security challenges. Uh, there is a lot of talk these days of a race to develop the Arctic and also a race to uh, lock down the security aspects of the Arctic. And some of you may have seen the recent reporting about Russia's base uh, that it has built in the Arctic. Uh, this is something I know that uh, the new Biden administration and the US military is looking at very actively. Obviously the State Department has a critical role in the diplomacy and we just had Secretary of State Blinken uh, at the Arctic Council meeting, a meeting with Minister Lavrov along with the other ministers uh, and we'll hear more about that uh, from our speaker. Um, obviously, there are challenges, there are also opportunities. And so one of the things we want to look at today is what does Arctic diplomacy look like? Uh, what does it mean for all of us uh, who do this for a living, those of us in the Foreign Service, as well as for our country? And uh, we're very, very lucky today uh, to have Jim DeHart, who's the U.S. coordinator for the Arctic region, who's just back from accompanying uh, Secretary Blinken uh, to the Arctic Council Ministerial in Reykjavik. And uh, Jim and I have known each other for almost three decades, I think. Uh, he has 28 years of experience as a member of the Foreign Service. He holds the rank of Minister Counselor in the Senior Foreign Service. And he was appointed to this position uh, in uh, July, 2020. Uh, with high hopes that it would uh, turn into something even bigger than it was, and it has. So um, we're so glad that we have the opportunity to welcome Jim and have the opportunity to talk to him today. And uh, what we'll be doing is starting with some questions just to guide the discussion. And then we'll open up to questions uh, from our audience. 
So with that, let me just say, Jim, uh, welcome. And uh, we really look forward to a great discussion. Ambassador Rubin, thanks very much. And I appreciate the invitation. And uh, I let me say also appreciate your great leadership and AFSA and we appreciate everything that that AFSA does for the for the service. Uh, thanks also Nadia for for organizing and um, and to the Foreign Service Journal, Sean Dorman and the whole team uh, for featuring the Arctic, um, my favorite region at least. Great, well, thank you. So um, as I mentioned, um, we just have some initial questions to get started before we open up for audience questions. And um, let me start by asking uh, about your views on, on what the effects of climate change are. As we, we discussed, this is already having enormous effects in terms of opening up transportation lanes, uh, opening up all sorts of secure potential security challenges, ge geopolitical changes. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how this affects our own uh, security and our own interests and also uh, what our priorities are as, as we confront this new set of challenges? Yeah, so, you know, climate change is really, uh, I think, the, the reason that we're even having this discussion. Uh, the Arctic is, is warming three times faster than uh, the global average. And um, it's, so it's becoming more accessible as the sea ice recedes, seasonal sea ice. And, you know, it, it's not gonna sort of immediately open up overnight because it's still a tough operating environment. Uh, but in the coming years and the decades, uh, it's going to become a busier place and it already is. Uh, so I think we can anticipate um, more activities of every, of every sort. Um, uh, more tourism, cruise vessels venturing farther north, uh, resource exploration, uh, and other countries getting involved. And, and so the PRC uh, has, has made it clear their interest in, uh, in being involved um, and present uh, in the Arctic. And so we have, to, uh, uh, we, have to, we have to plan ahead, I think, and, and think a little bit strategically, make sure that we're present and involved and that we're, we're looking um, across the board uh, at all of our interests, um, our security interests there, uh, our, our interest in, uh, in safety and um, having the uh, ability to respond to major pollution incidents uh, and oil spill under the ice would be, you know, potentially um, extremely challenging as an example. Uh, and also um, uh, how we uh, support the communities across the region, including citizens, U.S. citizens in our own state of Alaska, uh, because um, uh, remote communities need sustainable development as well. They need livelihoods. Great, thank you. Um, next question is about the increased interest and in activity in the Arctic by other nations. You've already mentioned the PRC. Um, I've always found it uh, intriguing that China has focused so heavily on the Arctic. Um, some have described this as just a reflection of the fact and in some re respects, China is now the other superpower the way the Soviet Union was during the Cold War and therefore has an interest in the entire globe. And we're actually, since the end of the Cold War, not really used to having another country other than the United States, uh, at least theoretically being interested in every single problem in every single corner of the world. But um, I think this is a new reality, but obviously also Russia, which has the biggest uh, chunk of, of, I guess you could call it uh, Arctic beachfront and, uh, and probably some of the biggest interests um, has been extremely engaged in, and focused on the Arctic. So the question I would ask is, is how is the United States uh, dealing with the fact that we're not alone, that we've got many other nations, two of them, uh, Russia and China, very, very significant players. And of course, there's also Canada, our neighbor to the North, uh, with whom we have wonderful relations generally, but occasionally disagree with about things. And I know this is an example in some cases. So um, how, how are we approaching that question? Yeah. So, you know, climate change, of course, is a, is a huge threat to all of us in the Arctic and beyond. Um, in the Arctic, the main uh, geopolitical threats, uh, Russia and China, and two very different kinds of threats. 
uh, Russia largely in the, in the realm of hard power and, and China requiring a bit more of a soft power response. Uh, and so, you know, first on Russia, uh, you know, the, re the reason we have concerns in the Arctic really is because we have concerns more broadly about uh, Russian behavior and Russia's trajectory, of course. But Russia is building up uh, in its part of the Arctic. It's refurbishing old military facilities. It's, it's uh, increasing its capabilities, military capabilities. Uh, and, um, and it's also exercising uh, quite aggressively its military forces. Uh, it's, um, it, it, there's, there's a lack of transparency in, in how Russia operates in the area. And there have been uh, instances of um, unprofessional behavior, including, for example, GPS jamming that took place during a, a transparent NATO exercise that affected civilian uh, air um, operations. So things of that nature that, that concern us uh, and concern uh, our allies and partners in the region. And, you know, on those, um, on those security issues, of course, NATO is, is key to uh, deterrence and preserving uh, the peace more broadly. Uh, NORAD and the great cooperation that we have with Canada there. And, and then, of course, we, we do um, a lot of that security work bilaterally as well with our close allies and, and partners. Uh, China uh, is, a, is kind of a, a, a different challenge. Uh, China's not an Arctic nation. Uh, but they're trying to develop their Arctic capabilities, their icebreakers, for example. Uh, they are clearly interested in gaining uh, critical infrastructure across the region. Uh, they have um, worked to acquire uh, mineral licenses um, to sort of get a foothold on the ground. They've, they've, uh, their state-owned companies have worked to get a piece of ports and, and airports, uh, digital infrastructure, of course. And, you know, so some of their investments, um, frankly, seem less focused on the commercial benefits and more focused on the strategic benefits of gaining a, a foothold there. Uh, their science presence, uh, also, you know, the kind of data that they collect, including from the, from the ocean floor, uh, has military as well as civilian applications. So that's, that's also of uh, concern. But, you know, clearly this is the PRC um, more globally ambitious. And, uh, you know, in their own description, they see uh, presence at both poles to be part of uh, their, you know, future great power status. Great, thank you very much. Um, now, having discussed the challenges and uh, some of the issues where we're having to assess the interests and, and goals of other countries, the other question that logically comes to mind is um, what are the opportunities for the United States? And how are we pursuing that? How have we changed the way we're pursuing that? Uh, and um, do we have a, a sort of grand plan for approaching our interests and our our objectives in the Arctic. Yeah, so, well, maybe that's a good segue into the big event that just took place in Reykjavik, the Arctic Council ministerial meeting, uh, May 19 and 20. And Eric, as you mentioned, um, Secretary Blinken uh, attended and participated in the ministerial uh, with all of the other uh, foreign ministers of um, Arctic uh, countries, uh, including Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski was there as part of our uh, COVID reduced uh, delegation. And so um, that was, uh, you know, her participation in this, I think was really uh, welcome and important. And I would say, you know, what a difference two years makes. Uh, at the last Arctic Council ministerial in Rovaniemi, Finland, back in 2019, uh, there was no agreement uh, on, a, um, on, on a declaration coming out of the ministerial. Uh, and that was um, largely uh, over differences on climate change uh, language uh, at that time. So, you know, fast forward to Reykjavik, Icelanders did, did a wonderful job, by the way, in their chairmanship and also in hosting the event. Um, you know, we, the first thing was we had uh, solidarity on a declaration uh, so that we're all, as Arctic states, including Russia, we're speaking with one voice 
on our desire for cooperation. Uh, we also had agreement by ministers on a um, strategic plan uh, for the Arctic Council and to guide the work uh, of the Arctic Council for the next 10 years, uh, to guide the focus of the various working groups that, that do all the real work uh, for the council, in the council. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, that setting out that plan, which is the first time this has happened in the Arctic Council, uh, really important as we go into the Russian chairmanship. Um, the other thing I would say about that is if you look at the strategic plan, climate is at the very top. So, uh, you know, I think everybody thrilled uh, to have U.S. leadership to address climate change, and it featured very prominently at the ministerial and in the strategic plan. Uh, we had um, great voices from indigenous communities in the ministerial. Uh, the um, six permanent participants who represent the major uh, indigenous communities across the entire Arctic, including from the state of Alaska, they participate together with ministers. Uh, and so um, their, their voices came across very strongly. And from what I heard, they were, they were quite happy with um, with how the declaration and the strategic plan reflected their interests, which was very good. Um, and so, you know, we talked about, we talked about, of course, the fact that we have security challenges that we're, uh, that we need to address and that we are addressing, but really the, um, the overarching theme here of this ministerial was that we really wanna preserve the region as a place of cooperation and keep cooperation at the forefront. And I think, um, I think that was really the main message that that came out of this event thank you jim and um, as you know uh, afs has been pushing very hard together with some of the employee affinity groups uh friends on the hill in both parties and now uh, the biden administration to uh, request additional resources budget and most importantly positions for the foreign service uh, we've been basically shrinking and cutting back for almost 30 years since the end of the Cold War, really for 30 years now. And, um, and a lot of us feel very strongly that we can't keep trying to do more with less. We actually need to try to do more with more, which means we need the funding and the resources and the positions uh, for American diplomacy in the field. And so my question for you is, uh, what do we need to meet this challenge? Um, what are the implications for our foreign service, uh, for all of the agencies? I know we already have uh, at least one other agency in Nuke at the new U.S. consulate. And, um, and what, are, what are our thoughts in terms of how we're going to meet this challenge internally? Yeah, so um, you mentioned uh, our new consulate in Nuke, and I had the, the opportunity to visit Nuke last fall and, and to meet the entire team there. And we have three Americans and an LES team as well. Uh, and a really great team on the ground. Well, I don't know, I guess I would, I would start by saying what a, you know, what a great bunch of jobs there. So um, I think those, you know, I, I could see those being um, heavily bid uh, in the future. It's a, it's a fascinating environment uh, in, which, uh, in which to work. Um, as, as long as uh, you don't need too much time in the, in the hot sun. Um, and the European Bureau uh, has, uh, uh, has established some Arctic watcher positions. Um, you know, not a huge number, but uh, has, has moved to make sure that we have the, the right positions to cover up north. Um, uh, Mission Canada has been really very active on this account and making sure that they have the personnel needed um, to engage remote communities in the far north of Canada, which, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is uh, sort of time and labor intensive to reach some of these places and to carry on um, those, those dialogues. Uh, so I think, you know, not a, not a dramatic shift of personnel by any means, um, you know, but, but making sure that we devote enough resources. Um, OES Bureau, which has really the, you know, the greatest depth of, of knowledge um, on the non-security issues, but the issues that are featured in the Arctic Council, 
you know, of course, their their role and and having the staff that they need uh, to to cover the council and to cover you know all those Arctic activities and work that takes place outside of the council too. Thanks. Now you mentioned obviously uh, Secretary Blinken's trip to the ministerial and the fact that he met with Minister Lavrov among other things. Uh, coming out of that is an announcement we just had yesterday of a presidential summit in Geneva in the middle of, of June. Uh, and there's a real question about what areas the United States and Russia might be able to, to focus on as areas for positive cooperation rather than just hostility and conflict and uh, suspicion uh, and uh, efforts to, to undercut each other. There has been some discussion in the media about uh, the Arctic as being a potential area for US-Russian cooperation. And uh, I wonder going into the newly announced summit, uh, do we have a, a proposal for the Russians? Are we looking at some specific steps to see if we can reach agreement with them on cooperation? Right. Well, I won't make any specific recommendations right this minute on the on the summit, but um, but I would say that uh, we favor cooperation with Russia and the Arctic Council, and and Russia now has taken on the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and and um, as Secretary Blinken said in the in the ministerial, we welcome the their chairmanship. Um, we look forward to working with them. Uh, and, you know, the history in the council has been that the eight Arctic states together with the indigenous representatives, you know, have worked together quite well, um, and including Russia. Um, I think, uh, you know, there is, um, there's good potential for, for cooperation within the council with Russia uh, on, on climate as it pertains uh, to the Arctic. Uh, environmental protection, sustainable development, um, wildland fires is a is a big issue, uh, and um, that that got a fair amount of discussion, sort of on the margins of the big meeting uh, in in Reykjavik, because it's a, you know, with with climate change, it's it, these severe wildfires that are raging across um, northern Russia, uh, also in Alaska. So it's a it's a problem we all share. And there are, you know, measures we could look at together to um, guard against um, and uh, such such events, and and also to be prepared for when they happen. Great, thanks. Um, and since you mentioned the Arctic Council and Russia's chairmanship and our our cooperation with the other seven countries. Uh, my question is, as this becomes a higher profile set of issues for everyone, including the United States, and as international cooperation hopefully expands on this set of issues, is the Arctic Council still the primary venue? Is some of this going to shift, for example, to New York and Geneva, to the UN fora, to other international uh, fora, or, or are we going to try to keep this within the Arctic Council framework where really only eight countries have a voice as opposed to all the members of the UN and all the members of the Security Council, et cetera. Right, well, what we see, and, and, and as Secretary Blinken said in Reykjavik, uh, we see the Arctic Council as the premier multilateral forum for the Arctic. And so we want um, uh, matters of Arctic governance uh, to reside in the Arctic Council. Uh, the Arctic Council has done this uh, really well uh, there's um, uh, uh, members of the, the council have negotiated agreements on search and rescue, a division of labor among the coast guards of the, the region, uh, an agreement on emergency preparedness and, and uh, pollution response, uh, an agreement on science cooperation uh, among the states. And, and that's something I think that we need to try to further implement, um, including uh, including with Russia. So, so the so the Arctic Council is doing really well, and it's and that's the forum we're going to look, you know, continue to look at for all these issues of governance uh, in the Arctic. On on climate, I mean, there are some Arctic specific climate challenges like black carbon and methane, uh, where and and some other areas where the Arctic Council is is doing very, uh, very good work. Um, the you know. 
as a global matter, of course, it's the UN process and leading up to the COP26 in Glasgow. Um, and, and so I think we would, you know, we would certainly be reluctant to take any steps or, um, you know, create any frameworks in, uh, in the Arctic that could detract or come into conflict with, with that main effort. Really, thank you. Um, and so um, one other question before we, we finish up. Um, you mentioned some of the progress we've made over the years in the Arctic Council. Um, there's some unfinished business. Uh, some of it is old unfinished business. One of the pieces is the Law of the Sea Treaty, uh, which uh, was negotiated in the 1970s originally, including by my former boss and, and dear friend, Ambassador Tom Pickering, when he was OES Assistant Secretary. And here we are in the 2020s, and we still are not uh, members. We have not ratified the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, how does that relate to the fact that we're no longer really dealing with one big sheet of ice, but we're actually dealing with, with sea, and increasingly the Arctic is going to be all about the seas? Right. So, um, so the Law of the Sea uh, protects U.S. interests uh, globally and um, also in the Arctic. Uh, we, even though we're not a party uh, to UNCLOS, we, uh, we view its, its major provisions as consistent with customary law and we adhere to the, to the main provisions. Um, and so, so we are benefiting uh, from, from that framework that, that exists. And, you know, and in fact, uh, there, there are perceptions out there that, you know, the Arctic is some, somehow ungoverned space, resources up for grabs and all that. I think it's, it's a little bit of a, perhaps a PRC narrative since they'd like to be involved in setting rules and gaining access to resources. The truth is uh, there, you know, there are strong existing um, institutions, Arctic Council and, and rules based primarily on law of the sea, which we adhere to and, and other states um, uh, including Russia with, with an exception or two, you know, also generally adhere um, to those, those rules. So we want to, we want to support those. And that's, that's really, you know, at the foundation of our approach there. So, you know, so it does, it does make it, um, it unfortunate that, that we're not actually a party uh, to, um, to a set of rules that favor us so strongly. Uh, and, you know, uh, personally speaking, I would like to see that change. I, I think most that um, most folks who look at this region and at the issue more broadly uh, favor our becoming a party and think it was very much in U.S. interests. Uh, but, you know, but there's a whole set of considerations here when we talk about Senate ratification that go beyond my remit and, um, uh, you know, and, and have to be fully considered so um, uh, so it's a uh, it's a that's a that's a decision uh, uh, beyond my pay grade great thank you well that's it for the initial questions and what I'd like to do now we're already getting quite a, a number of great questions from the audience is ask my colleagues to uh, take over and um, pose some of the questions and uh, we, we do have plenty of time for that. So I'm, I'm glad we already have so many questions lined up. So over to Nadia. Great, thank you. Thank you both for that excellent informative discussion. There are a lot of questions, so we'll try to get through as many of them uh, today as we can, um, understanding that we do have um, 30 minutes left. So to start the first question, maybe uh, not surprisingly so, is about, uh, Russia, and uh, now that Russia has assumed chairmanship of the Arctic Council, what should we expect to see? And are there any U.S. concerns about the next two years? And then in particular, what do you make of Russia's call for security dialogue in the Arctic Council? Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, our, our going in position uh, with the Russian chairmanship is, is uh, we want to keep the cooperation going. And so we're very much prepared uh, to work with Russia during its, uh, its chairmanship. And, and, I, and I mentioned some of the areas where I think there's real potential um, to, to do useful work uh, together with Russia. 
Uh, I think at the, you know, at the same time, um, uh, we, we've emphasized the importance uh, of Russia sticking to the, the normal practices of the Arctic Council, uh, making sure that, um, that it keeps the Council focused across the entire Arctic, uh, rather than only in its backyard, uh, for the benefit of people living across the entire circumpolar region. Uh, and also um, the importance of, of consulting, I think, early and often with other Arctic Council states on, you know, events and projects and activities that that uh, it may wish to launch. Uh, I, I think that I think that Russia will make a lot of its chairmanship. I think they're very interested. Um, they're gearing up to do a lot. Uh, they they uh, you know they'll probably um, uh, seek to organize and host a lot of different events. And so here you know here again. I think it'll be really important for, for Russia to consult those events um, because the council does operate by consensus. Um, and so if something is going to be an Arctic Council event, it really needs to have the support of all the, uh, the members. Uh, and then Nadia, you mentioned um, uh, Russia has called for some kind of uh, security uh, dialogue. Um, others uh, have, have called for that as well. Uh, you know, first point is Arctic Council shouldn't do security. Uh, it, its mandate explicitly excludes security. We want to keep it focused um, on sustainable development, environmental protection, all the, all the things it does really well. And, you know, as for something then outside the council, um, we, have, we have a number of mechanisms already, I think, that that help us address the possibility of a, of a military miscalculation or something else that we would want to avoid. I mean, we've got the Vienna document, which provides for transparency of forces, and we have the, um, the incidents at sea and air agreement that, um, uh, that guards against uh, mishaps um, you know, in the region and more broadly. Um, we have ways to talk to Moscow, clearly, so I um, we have to be a little bit careful about the creation of sort of new dialogues or restoring old dialogues that stopped at, uh, when Russia violated Ukrainian sovereignty back in 2014, um, because it can be a pathway for Russia to try to rehabilitate its image uh, and its standing with the international community, um, which we don't want to do. And and you know I think we have to we have to be very deliberate about it. We have to ask you know is the is the problem that we have, is it really one, you know, that exists because of a lack of a forum or is it more of a, you know, a substantive issue and um, a lack of political will on one side uh, to be constructive? Thank you for that very thorough and thoughtful answer. Um, in the same vein, uh, we have a question about um, the Arctic Council and dealing with uh, some issues that go sort of beyond its traditional remit. Um, so how do we tackle commercial transportation and military issues? And will the Arctic nations be able to work on most of the new issues through the council or are there other ad hoc cooperative uh, arrangements um, becoming necessary? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, the Arctic Council captures a lot that um, so many of the issues that that connect to people's ability to, to lead better lives in the region, right? And so, you know, it has, um, the Arctic Council has done work on, uh, on infrastructure, on connectivity, you know, because remote communities are are very interested in better broadband. I mean, lack of communications is really an issue. Um, you know, so all of these, uh, these issues that relate to essentially the economic sphere and um, the ability for people to, you know, develop livelihoods, they're covered pretty well, um, uh, including through the Sustainable Development Working Group um, in the Arctic Council. Fisheries a little bit less so. I mean, it's largely been handled outside the Arctic Council and, and uh, you know, and in, in, and in fact, um, a few years ago, uh, uh, we, you know, a number of states signed a, a new 
agreement that will keep the Arctic Ocean off limits to fishing until we better understand um, what we're doing there. And, and a, you know, kind of a rare preventative agreement that we managed to do, a number of states beyond the Arctic Council. Um, but I think, I think uh, with the exception uh, of military security, we are, we are getting to most of those issues that were identified. Thank you. Um, switching to US Arctic policy, uh, the question asks, where is the balance between environment slash climate change slash sustainability on the one hand and then security and economic interests on the other? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, uh, just as the Foreign Service is routinely called upon to do more with less, uh, we, have to, we have to do it all, I think, in the Arctic. We've got, we've got serious security challenges. We've got to do a lot of work through NATO and NORAD and bilaterally to address those. Um, and uh, we've got to give a lot of attention to safety uh, in the Arctic, and we have to um, be sufficiently present, I think, that we can respond if a cruise trip, uh, a cruise ship runs into trouble, you know, um, way up north in a place that it has never been, you know, and can we respond quickly enough? We have to be able to respond to a major oil spill, and we have to, we have to have the the knowledge and the technology to be able to get oil out from under the ice, if that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, we've got a huge interest in science collaboration. And I really think, you know, science collaboration in the Arctic may be the gold standard. I mean, it's, you know, we have fantastic work by National Science Foundation, uh, NOAA, NASA, uh, Office of Naval Research, um, others uh, who are there, you know, we've got, uh, NASA has a satellite that measures the Greenland ice cap to the width of a pencil, um, you know, and what we, the knowledge that we generate uh, through our scientific research, we share that and we collaborate through the Arctic Council and beyond the Arctic Council and with a number of non-Arctic nations. We've got to keep, we've got to keep doing that because we have to keep understanding what's happening on climate. And, you know, the Arctic is, is, a, is a great place to, uh, to study that. And, and then the economic dimension, um, you know, we, uh, we need to support communities, including our own citizens in Alaska, uh, to, you know, with ways to um, develop their livelihoods, uh, a pro-business approach, but it's gotta be the right kind of business. You gotta make sure it's, high standard and protects the environment uh, and that it's aligned with our climate change goals. Um, critical minerals, key to a, a, a cleaner, greener future, super important, um, you know, but, but, uh, but mining is a delicate issue um, and local communities have strong views on that and there are environmental repercussions. So we have to take all this into consideration, you know, but if we don't invest, Others will, like the PRC, and they will do it in ways that, that don't benefit local communities or, or may have implications for our national security interests. So, you know, so I think the, the answer is we, gotta, we, have to, <laughs> we have to do it all. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, so comprehensive, comprehensive approach uh, is, is what we're um, committed to and, um, and what this administration believes in. Um. That is quite the uh, comprehensive approach that you've just outlined uh, and comprehensive issues that you have to tackle. Um, as a follow-up to that question, um, what role do you see in, uh, in how multinational scientific research can help and assist Arctic diplomacy? Yeah, so we have, you know, we have a, uh, a great relationship, I think, with a, with a science community. Um, there's, a, there's a hugely enthusiastic community of science scientists working on the Arctic. Um, I think, I think the, you know, one of the bureaucratic challenges is how do we make sure we're organized in our system in such a way that we're bringing together the comprehensive approach. And so you have, you know, science voices at the table together with those who are, you know, dealing with the security aspects and, and other aspects, because it all gets, it actually does all get weaved together, you know, if, 
that it all comes together, for example, on an icebreaker, you know, the Coast Guard does an amazing job. And when they send out their icebreakers, um, they've got scientists on board who are doing climate research. They're doing research that's gonna benefit uh, the US, uh, US economic interests, you know, uh, protecting the maritime environment, fisheries and all that, you know, and then they might be called on to rescue a, a sinking cruise, cruise vessel, you know, or respond to a major pollution incident or something, you know, somebody is doing something illegal they shouldn't and, and it suddenly it becomes a law enforcement action. So, you know, the, all this stuff comes together um, and uh, we got to address it as a whole. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned that if we're not doing the investments, others might step in and we already discussed that there's a lot of interest um, in, in uh, investing in the region. Um, this question asks, uh, to further Arctic diploma climate diplomacy, has the US considered asking China to seize investment in Russian Arctic oil and gas exploration? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not intimately um, uh, aware, I guess, of the, some of the conversations at the bilateral level. I think, I would say generally speaking, um, you know, I would be surprised if, if, um, if they stopped those activities. Um, and uh, the Russians uh, from their end uh, have decided, I think, that they have no other way to get to the hydrocarbons um, except through Chinese uh, investment, and so they're seeking that. Uh, you know, and um, of course, it's pretty clear that this this would not seem to align with what needs to be done on 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 climate. So, you know, um, so I would imagine that uh, that those discussions could take place in the climate context, but um, a little bit out of my range of vision. You had mentioned the icebreaker is kind of the microcosm or perfect example of the type of comprehensive issues you have to think about in dealing with the Arctic. So will there be a significant icebreaker building program since the US has few, so few? Yeah, so um, Coast Guard has two vessels now, uh, a heavy icebreaker, the Polar Star, and then the Healy, which is more of a, a medium size. Um, and they're great ships, but they're a bit old. Um, <laughs> and uh, Coast Guard does have plans underway uh, for, um, for three new um, heavy icebreakers and hopefully more beyond that, um, possibly mid-sized. Uh, the first one won't be available, uh, you know, for, for several years. And, um, you know, so this, this will take some time, I think, for us to develop the kind of capable icebreaker uh, fleet that I think we need as an Arctic nation. But, but you know, there are plans and there is work underway uh, to achieve that goal. Thank you. Um, we had a few questions on this general topic uh, or this general idea of the cooperation, the US interagency cooperation. Um, how much is there between the Department of State, Coast Guard, National Science Foundation? Who else does your office work with both inside and um, inside the State Department and outside the State Department? Yeah, um, yeah, no, thank you for that question because you know, uh, I, um, I, am, I am merely the coordinator and we have all sorts of people across our building that are, you know, that are doing the, the, the real work uh, of Arctic diplomacy and other, you know, and other steps. So um, we work across the various bureaus, the regional bureaus, uh, EUR, which has most of the bilateral relationships in the Arctic. Um, but then there's Mission Canada as well, has a very important relationship. And the Arctic is high on our bilateral agenda with Canada. And you know, so they're, they are doing that work um, bilaterally. EU are handling the work through NATO, uh, Canada through, um, through NORAD. Um, a lot of the, the security issues really need to be handled there. OES, as I mentioned, you know, has this tremendous depth of knowledge on, on everything related, you know, ranging from law of the sea to the Arctic Council to, you know, um, everything else in the non-military sphere. And so we work really closely. 
Um, some, the uh, economic side of the house, uh, EB, you know, has a role to play, I think, when we talk about um, investment standards, infrastructure standards. Uh, ENR, uh, energy uh, resources, they've provided um, and are providing, you know, they've got some great partnerships with Greenland going uh, in particular, uh, which is great to see. So you have, um, and, and of course, SPEC, which we, we work closely with as, as climate connects to the, um, to the Arctic, and there's others too. But it's a, it's a region where sort of everybody, you know, it, there's so many entities that are cross-cutting. Um, there's uh, multiple combatant commands, NORTHCOM, European Command, Strategic Command, SPACECOM now. Um, even Indo-PACOM touches on the Arctic through Alaska. Uh, so there's, you know, and then the, the various branches of the services and the science agencies that I mentioned uh, before. Um, Department of Transportation has, a, has an important link, I think, you know, to Alaska. Um, and because actually, you know, part of this here um, in the interim national security strategic guidance that was issued by our president in March, um, really interesting uh, element of that, I think, was the uh, connection, the importance of the connection between foreign policy and what we do domestically. Uh, and it's so relevant to the Arctic because Alaska is so central um, to the Arctic. They're the reason we are an Arctic nation. And what we do in Alaska, when we invest in Alaska, if we invest on, for example, you know, a deep water port or other forms of, of, of uh, shipping infrastructure, that has a direct relation to uh, our ability to project influence beyond the American Arctic. These two things are tied together. So, um, uh, you know, so, so I think ideally uh, you would have people at the table who can speak to both um, the domestic uh, investment questions, you know, alongside those who are looking at foreign policy in the Arctic because they, um, they deserve to be looked at together. Coast Guard, uh, uh, you know, icebreakers is another example of this when we talk about home porting and so forth. But, um, uh, but I think, you know, really important focus of this administration, that foreign policy and domestic policy link. Yeah. Um, switching back to what was discussed at the Arctic Council, um, this question asks whether there was any discussion of fisheries, mineral extraction, travel, tourism, um, or are those issues addressed elsewhere? Those are, um, I would say, sort of wrapped into uh, the, the discussions that do take place under, uh, you know, fisheries, as I've mentioned, is, um, doesn't fall sort of directly under the council. It's largely handled um, uh, elsewhere. But, you know, under that sort of umbrella of sustainable development, we capture a lot. Good. Okay, so... Um... Arctic Climate Treaty, the question goes, uh, since protecting the climate has such, a ma has such massive implications on the American people and our economy, and since the U.S. has traditionally steered clear of similar treaties in the past, does the U.S. government plan on changing its approach to climate change and other international issues? I know that climate change is not necessarily within your narrow remit, but well, well, we've, you know, certainly um, changed our approach to climate change significantly in our new administration, yeah. which was loudly welcomed uh, by our um, allies and partners um, at the ministerial meeting. Um, I, you know, I would not expect anything along the lines of an Arctic climate treaty. I think that, um, you know, to my earlier point, uh, we're, uh, you know, former Secretary Kerry and his team are very much focused on the COP process, the UN process. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to get crosswise with that. Uh, but for the Arctic, there is there is work we can do on black carbon in particular. Uh, and um, the Arctic Council states have made some commitments on their reduction, some national aspirational commitments to reduce black carbon. And I think the door is open to increase those commitments in the future. Uh, and also the door is open for us to, you know, to look at the Arctic Council observer states uh, to make similar 
commitments. So there's work that can be done, but I don't think it's going to take the form of, you know, a, a legally binding treaty. Thank you. Okay, so here's a, a an, I guess, an easy question. Um, it's about who is the new ambassador to Greenland? Is he a replacement or is it a new position? <laughs> um, I, I, the, uh, the, uh, the, U, the new ambassador to the kingdom of Denmark, um, I don't know who it will be. Okay. Um, so I think we are counting down to the, the final couple of questions. Um, and these are from, I think, burgeoning diplomats or young, younger diplomats. Um, it says, uh, this is a great conversation, very informative. Um, what recommendations do you have for new foreign service officers uh, who would like to develop expertise in Arctic policy or work on Arctic issues? Uh, well, you know, I think, um, I. Th I think read uh, and, and, and do this on your own time because there's no guarantee that you'll get such an assignment that would put you in that position, but it's a fascinating uh, region and a fascinating set of, uh, set of issues. So, um, but you know, uh, the Foreign Service doesn't always send us precisely to the places, you know, that align with our recent experience. Um, we tend to have to be, uh, uh, flexible, but you know you're entering a, a fantastic uh, field, and you have the ability, I think, to shape your career um, however you would like to, and it, which is one of the rare, you know, really unique um, things about the Foreign Service. And are there any particular books or the or articles or something that you would recommend? Is another related question. Um. Barry Lopez has written some books. I think Arctic Dreams is is kind of a is kind of a nice one. Um, uh, there have um, been some books on Greenland as well. I don't know if the authoritative book on the Arctic has been written yet, so that's a challenge to somebody out there. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you very much. Um, this has been a really great, unfortunately we're out of time and we need to start wrapping up, but we've had a very broad um, discussion on uh, what is a much broader issue. So thank you for your time today. Um, I will turn it over to Ambassador Rubin for a few uh, last words before we wrap up. Uh, thank you, Jim, for a fascinating discussion. And uh, it's actually raised a lot of, of questions in my mind that I want to pursue, and I'm sure for members of our audience as well. I hope uh, some of our AFSA members on this call will end up working on these issues and uh, maybe even working with you. And I want to thank you for everything you've done uh, for all of us in, in advancing this really important agenda uh, this is really a new frontier for American diplomacy, and that's exciting. Um, in that regard, I do want to mention that Sun Choi, our, our principal officer at our new consulate in Nuke, Greenland, is, I believe, on the call. And I just wanted to thank him and salute him and the whole team there and uh, say how much we appreciate what they're doing on the frontiers of American diplomacy. I want to thank all of our uh, audience, all of our members, and all of our guests who joined and uh, everyone who, who posed such interesting questions. Uh, it's really been a great discussion. So um, with that, I look forward to uh, pursuing this further. And I want to thank Jim again for, for joining us and for uh, helping us have a really fascinating hour. Thank you so much. Eric, Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really great to be here with uh, so many colleagues, um, whether visible or not, but, you know, everybody out there around the world doing fantastic work, including Sung and Nuke and his team. So uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks. Thank you both. Just a few last um, reminders or notices before we um, wrap up today. Um, if you haven't, as Ambassador Rubin mentioned, our May issue of the Foreign Service Journal is devoted to Arctic diplomacy, and there is actually an article in there interviewing Coordinator DeHart. So please do check it out. We'll drop the link in the chat box, um, afsa.org slash foreign service journal. 
Um, as I had mentioned, this event is uh, recorded, has been recorded, and we will be sharing the link on our website and to those uh, with those who registered, along with a couple of the other um, relevant documents mentioned today. And we'll send that out in about um, two to three days. Um, I do want to remind everybody that we do have an event coming up in June on a related topic. It's about the U.S. consulate in Nook, Greenland. Um, and that's uh, through our virtual series, Diplomats at Work. So keep an eye out. We'll be sending the invitations shortly. And then um, finally, if you're not a member and you enjoy these events and you want to um, keep coming to these events and you want to know when they're happening, um, please let us know by emailing events at afsa.org and we'll put you on our distribution list. And so with that, I thank everyone again, um, Courtney DeHart, uh, Ambassador Rubin, and all the audience for the fantastic questions today. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. See you thank next you. time. <laughs>